Welcome to Rebel Roundup, ladies and gentlemen, and the rest of you, in which we look back at some of the very best commentaries of the week by your favorite rebels. I'm your host, David Menzies. In the name of climate change, the Dutch government has declared war on its own farmers. And guess what? The farmers and their supporters, well, they are fighting back. Louis Brackpool joins me for the latest news from the Netherlands. And the other day, Alexa Lavoie bumped into Justin Trudeau at an Outremont restaurant. Alexa had plenty of questions to ask, but suddenly it looked like the cat caught the PM's tongue. Alexa will join me with all the nitty gritty and letters. We get your letters. We get your letters every minute of every day. And I'll share some of your hilarious responses regarding our new Justin Trudeau slash Fidel Castro t-shirt which is flying off the shelves these days, by the way. Those are your rebels, now let's round them up. Canadians have stepped up to do the right thing to protect the freedoms and the rights of Canadians to get back to the things we love to do. It's, like, it's, just, it's just so tough to watch, there's no reason for that. They were literally running the horses through the crowd. I understand it's like a tactic that they use to try and split up the crowd. Trudeau, you're messing with the wrong people. The 10% is after you if you think it's only 10%. This is something I don't, well, I've certainly never seen before. And federal authorities and politicians, we hear you, but we want to be heard as well. This is Lewis Brackpool for Rebel News and today I'm in an undisclosed location about to follow farmers and their supporters to the German border where they plan to block the border between the Netherlands and Germany. Now people have started to turn up now waving the Netherlands flag upside down as we know it's a call to distress or if their country is in a kind of crisis they would fly that upside down. They also have the red bandanas which show the support for the farmers and there is a few people turned up already early and ready to hit the road to the German borders. I'm going to be going around and asking people why are they here and why is this protest so important? It's the WEF that was wants to uh, have a whole world reset and we are the first one to pick out. Do you, think, do you think a lot of farmers know about the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset? Yes, I know for sure, because uh, they already know that all the rules are bullshit. Because right. I have a small child and I want her to know that it's the farmers that get the food on the table and the government is just wrong for doing this. Mm. Uh, I think uh, Europe is going to go down. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and the civil war is going to start. So we're currently sandwiched in a convoy of supporters for the farmers where they're making their way to the German border on the A37 with plans to, I believe, block the border. Now you're probably wondering, how am I standing in the middle of a highway on the A37? Let's take a look. Dutch farmer supporters have blocked it. How do you feel, how do you think the Dutch government has treated the farmers? No, not, not, not good, good. Not, not good. good. It should be the different. Uh, yeah. Something needs to change? Yes, yes. yes. 
I think they have. Yeah. yeah. I think the farmers have, have to be more right. Like, have to have more rights. Yeah, have to have more rights. So why are you here today specifically? Um, we just want to go home. Yeah, yeah we are. We are stuck here. Yeah, by accident. Yeah, but you didn't know that this was this was uh, gonna happen. No, we didn't know. Okay. We're, we're from a we want to go home. Party. <laughs> we're from a but we understand. Party. We understand. But yeah. if the police turn up to this blockade, um, what will happen? What is your next move? It's what the police do if they are, um, how do you say it, um, nice to us, we will talk with them, but if they are going to fight with us, maybe we we'll fight back. It's on to the police, if they want to talk with us, then we talk and maybe we can go or some, somewhere else, but most time it's the police that go fight first. I guess it's safe to say then that tensions are very high in the Netherlands right now? Yes. Um, I think they're going to say that we can stay here for a little bit, but he says it's dangerous behind the back of the... the Queue? Yes, because they're coming in with 100, 110 uh, speed, so it's dangerous. And we said, yeah, then you have to put someone there with uh, sirens on so they can see it. What do you think happens next then? I don't know if uh, we have to leave. I think we're gonna leave because we don't want to fight. We're just in peace with them and they are in peace with us, so it's okay. There are good cops and there are bad cops and that's always, but they can always, maybe these are the good cops and they sometimes you have bad cops. But it's, it's like how they come to us. If they come to us like this, then it's not good. Well, there you have it, folks. The Dutch government might be fine with declaring war on its farmers, but the farmers are not fine with this, and neither are their supporters. After all, everyone has a skin in the game in that we all need to eat, right? And joining me now from Holland is our UK correspondent, and that would be Lewis Brackpool. How you doing there, Lewis? How are you back in Canada? Oh, I'm doing great. It looks like uh, you're right in front of a beautiful postcard setting. So I, uh, I wish I was there with you. Now, Lewis, I got to tell you, you and Lincoln Jay, you've been doing a great job covering this farmer's rebellion. But can you rewind the tape a bit and take us back a couple of weeks? What was the basis for the farmers rebelling against their government in the first place? Yeah, thanks for having me, mate, and it's good to see you. Um, so, the, the Dutch government are looking to impose radical green policies uh, against the Dutch farmers to reduce nitrogen emissions, and uh, in some cases, and in some particular farms, up to 95%, which, as we know, is, is basically impossible. And to do this, they want to take, forcefully take, uh, around... 30 to 50 percent of farmlands within the Netherlands. So that means they can, well, basically do whatever they want with it, really. They can build on top, they can do whatever. On top of this, um, under the guise of reducing nitrogen emissions, they want to cut livestock as well, uh, so which means cattle and food, essentially. So the farmers who have been Many of them have been uh, utilizing their farms for generations now, uh, have decided, you know what, enough is enough. We've been protesting uh, these radical policies that have been creeping through ever so suddenly since 2019, where they started mobilizing around uh, the Netherlands. But now it's accelerated so dramatically, they, f they thought, do you know what, enough's enough. We're going to go out and we're going to make our voices heard because the government aren't uh, doing their due diligence for the people. And Lewis, the government, who exactly are they trying to appease uh, by with these crackpot policies? I mean, like I said earlier, we all depend on food. These are farmers, I imagine, with the with costs rising on a monthly basis are having enough of a tough time. But it seems that with the environmental zealots these days, uh, nitrogen is the new N word, if you will. But why is this government seemingly bending the knee to the Greta Thunberg demographic as opposed to trying to, you know, have an environment for their farmers where they can make a living and feed the people? Well, to be honest with you, Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, is a World Economic Forum puppet. Mm. He is uh, he's spouting every single World Economic Forum playbook under the sun, and he's so open with it. He's spoken 
about Agenda 2030 and sustainable development on uh, on the Netherlands, where they want to, of course, cut things such as petrol out of the uh, out of everything. Uh, so they say similar thing that's been happening around the world, um, and he's. He's repeating mantras from the, the WEF, such as Build Back Better and Agenda 2030. So it's quite clear to see who really is pulling the strings on the policies. And it is, of course, the World Economic Forum up to their no good once again. And it's, it's all for everyone to see. Unbelievable. And, you know, um, Lewis, when we look at those buzzwords, build back better, well, that's a fallacy. Yeah. All these policies are making our lives more miserable and more expensive. The so-called new normal, it's actually abnormal if you believe in progress and exceptionalism. So, again, you know, it, it, it's a false narrative as far as I'm concerned. It seems to be about virtue signaling and wokeism. And I guess the ultimate question is, if you, you know, if there was a, um, a plebiscite or a poll uh, in the Netherlands right now, how many people, how many normal citizens are on board with this environmental madness in the first place? It's a great question. I think a poll came out recently, and obviously we know that polls are, are very inaccurate, so take them with a pinch of salt. But a poll that I did read uh, said, suggested that 80% of the public actually support the farmers. And what we've been seeing on the ground uh, covering this, there has been overwhelming support for the farmers, not just domestically, but internationally. So that's definitely something to, uh, to keep in mind. We have seen, of course, some people that are against the farmers, which is, if I'm, if I'm to give my opinion, is absolute madness because they are the ones that feed the city people, uh, for crying out loud. Um, so you've got these climate zealots in the city that are saying, yeah, sure, farmers should just give up their lands for the, for the climate agenda. And it's... It's almost a shock when you hear things like that. This, there's this massive divide uh, between uh, a lot of the city people and the rural areas. And we see that everywhere. Um, but this divide, when we've spoken to people, maybe we've picked some really co good people to chat to. But there has been the odd one that, uh, that has been quite, uh, well, a bit of a climate fanatic, <laughs> to put it so uh, bluntly. It's amazing because whether or not you're a climate fanatic, we all share something in common. We have to eat. And by eating, I mean, you know, beef, chicken, pork, not insects, as some of these uh, World Economic Forum people preach to us. You know, uh, Lewis, the, when this began, the images were startling. You, you saw massive farm equipment blocking highway. You saw the spraying of liquid manure uh, at government offices and so on. Where is this all heading? I mean, obviously, the farmers, for their very livelihood, want the government to reverse its stance on nitrogen and other policies. Do you see them being successful or uh, is the government in for uh, a long haul fight on this? It's a, it's a very, very good question because um, from what we're hearing on the ground, David, uh, they're very, very unhappy and a lot. I always ask the same question okay, to, to, every, to every farmer and every supporter. I say, if the demands are not met from the farmers, what do you think will happen? And the same answer comes every time. And that's a civil war. Now, in my personal opinion, that's a very scary thing to hear um, because, of course, naturally, people do not want that. And I know that people do not want that. And it's scary to hear that when you have this huge overreach from the government. And um, it's, I can't quite explain it if I'm totally honest. Uh, this, is, this is just uh, completely raw for myself, but it's, it's scary. And they are scared. They're anxious that their livelihoods, and it's not just an occupation, it's, it's something that's, that's passed down from generations. This, this isn't just a, a job or working in a shop. You know, this is, you're feeding the nation. You're feeding Europe in the ne Netherlands case because they are a very large exporter in food and supply chain. So 
this isn't a local issue. This is an international issue. So, yeah, this they are they are very worried that if their demands aren't met, that things will escalate and badly. And one last question, Lewis. You said this is an international issue, and I want to, uh, you know, focus in on that statement because a lot of people might say, "Oh, the Netherlands." I, I wouldn't be able to find the Netherlands on a map, for goodness' sakes. That's way over across the pond. My response, and I believe you interviewed farmers there, uh, Lewis, saying the same thing, is that right now it's the Netherlands. In the near future, it might be coming to the country you reside in, i.e. And, and by the way, when it comes to Canada, I can totally see the Justin Trudeau liberals getting on board the anti-nitrogen uh, brigade and your farmers will suffer and your people will suffer from increased food prices and even scarcity of food items. Last word goes to you, my friend. OK, so we're seeing similar patterns everywhere uh, in other countries, for example, Britain. Uh, the government are actually handing out almost uh, payments to farmers to stop farming in the height of, uh, well, a cost of lockdown crisis uh, where inflation is at its highest. And it's just absolute madness what, what they're doing. So that's my country. They want to wean off farmers from actually farming and pay them to stop. I tried speaking out to the farmers union. I got nothing back. Strange. Um, Canada, they've obviously signed a, a new treaty with the Netherlands, that's a, that's a big impact where it basically gives more power to the multinationals. So you're seeing this overarch in all the countries now, uh, and especially with Canada. I'm pretty concerned, if I'm totally honest, of where we're heading. And this is all part of the Great Reset. This is all part of the Agenda 2030 that we keep hearing about. And I think more and more people need to start start questioning things a bit more. I mean, we were always told that things such as the Great Reset and Agenda 2030 and the sustainable developments is some sort of conspiracy theory. These, these practices are accelerating rapidly now. And this is all being said by the World Economic Forum. This is not something that we are saying as reporters or journalists and plucking it out of thin air. This is coming from them. And people need to start realizing that until until something horrible happens like what the farmers keep talking about so that's that's my take well lewis i want to thank you for your time you and lincoln have been doing a great job there and i, I think what's so frustrating for me and i suspect our audience is that farming is so fraught uh, with difficulties as it is. I mean, you could end up in a season where there's drought or the opposite might be the case, flooding and the crop is wiped out. This attack on farming, it's not mother nature. It's the elected representatives of these farmers. It is a disgrace and it's shameful and it's a complete self-inflicted wound. Let's hope this has a happy ending in the uh, days and weeks ahead. And uh, we'll uh, definitely keep our eye on this. So thank you again, Lewis. No, thank you for having me on. It's, it's great to chat to you again. And um, I think I'm off to pop my uh, new clogs on that I've been gifted. So uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> it's, it's the old fashioned new age elevator shoes, I guess. But, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you'll look resplendent. You know, thank you again, uh, Lewis. And you have a great weekend, my friend. And that was Lewis Brackpool in the Netherlands. Keep it here, folks. More of Rebel Roundup to come right after this. Well, the remains of 215 children have been found in a mass grave in Canada. Many of you know that just over a year ago, the discovery of the remains of 215 children was found at the Kamloops Indian Residential School at the Kamloops Shiswemek First Nation. But what if I were to show you that what I just said wasn't true? and that in fact, a year later, not a single body has been found. This mass grave is a painful reminder of the genocide. Canada's leaders aren't condemning the burning of churches. No, they're endorsing the burning of churches. A juvenile rib bone that surfaced in the same area. <laughs> Prime Minister, any, any, any...
Any answers? Any answers for disrupting the lives of so many Canadians for the last 20 years? Prime Minister, any answers? Please answer the people of Canada. The wow, that's very oh, oh, they are pushing the plan to hide Mr. Trudeau. They are pushing the plans for it. Can you believe that? No, ne, ne me touchez pas. Je fais mon travail de journaliste, monsieur. Je ne toucherai pas. l'autre côté. Sur quelle raison? Celle que c'est un ordre. La police vous donne un ordre, vous obéissez. Ça finit que ça finit. Écoutez, ne, ne me poussez pas. Non, mais vous allez traverser. So now, the police are giving me an order to cross the other side. Hey, vous n'avez pas le droit de me, me toucher, monsieur. Je veux ben, juste vous rappeler qu'on a déjà une poursuite contre, contre la SPD. Votre nom, votre batch number. Krukowski, c'est marqué là. 604, bye bye. So, here, Alex, for Ruben News, and I'm currently in Montreal. And Rick. Tonight, we received a tip that Mr. Trudeau was in Outremont for having a dinner with maybe co-worker or friend. So we ran on the scene to see what is happening. And what you can see behind me, police is there all around the restaurant. They have a lot of citizens who are asking questions. I'm going to take the chance to ask as well my question to them. Let's check it out. Monsieur Trudeau, est-ce que vous vous rappelez de moi? On s'est déjà parlé au combat des chefs. Euh, J'espère que oui. Euh, je m'intéressais à savoir, Monsieur Trudeau, euh, votre Avril Khan, est-ce que c'est en fait euh, la nouvelle version de, du non Digital Traveler Identity que vous avez signé avec le World Economic Forum en 2018, Monsieur Trudeau? Tamara Leach est une manifestante pacifique qui est en ce moment en prison elle, parce qu'elle a juste pris un selfie avec un autre manifestant. Est-ce que vous trouvez ça normal ici au Québec? Oui. Vous êtes déjà rencontré à d'autres Oui. Tout ce que je vous demande, c'est que, un, c'est un événement privé. Deux, il y a d'autres clients du restaurant aussi. Le premier ministre, je vous pas privé, monsieur. Non, mais je ne parlerai pas, mais M. Trudeau aurait l'exigence peut-être de venir parler aux gens qui ont des questions pour lui. C'est possible de respecter l'inquiétude des autres gens autour aussi. M. Trudeau. Monsieur Trudeau, est-ce que vous supportez euh, les nouvelles régulations au niveau de l'émission d'azote euh, et de carbone que Marc Routé est en train d'implémenter euh, en Hollande? Est-ce que vous supportez le, euh, les régulations, Monsieur Trudeau? Ah, mais c'est le, le même premier ministre qui se promène en jet. Qui se promène en jet. On dérange le reste de mes clients. Si on peut juste me laisser travailler. Alors, pourquoi ils ont pris une table à l'extérieur? Ah, oui. Si, si vous voulez la privacité. Moi, je, fais, je, fais, je, fais Moi, je suis juste dans le trottoir. Je, je juste... et Monsieur Trudeau, pourquoi vous écoutez pas une partie de votre peuple qui a des questions pour vous. Do you support the new regulation on nitrogen and carbon emission that Mark Rutte are doing right now in Netherlands? Mr. Trudeau doesn't want to answer to any question. I tried to ask question in French and in English just to see if he will answer and obviously he's not doing it. So we can see like the nice meal that Mr. Trudeau is having probably on our tax fair. Your money, guys, and he's eating your money and he's not answering the question that he should answer. Monsieur Trudeau, quel autre accord avez-vous signé avec le World Economic Forum? I've never been as close as Mr. Trudeau, but obviously he's not turning his face to watch or to try to have a contact with me. He's completely ignoring a part of the people that is on the street asking questions to him. Monsieur Trudeau, je vais répéter encore une fois, Tamara Leach, qui est une manifestante pacifique, est retenue en prison pour avoir pris un selfie avec un autre manifestant. Est-ce que les libéraux ne soutiennent plus maintenant les libertés civiles? Well, there you go, folks. Once again, the Montreal Police Service is living up to its reputation as perhaps the worst police force in Canada. Then again, when it comes to Justin Trudeau, he's also living up to his reputation as perhaps one of the worst prime ministers in Canadian history. Unbelievable. And joining me now for more on this encounter is the reporter who encountered Justin Trudeau in Outremont herself, and that would be Alexa Lavoie. Bonjour, Alexa. 
Bonjour. <laughs> okay. Well, Alexa, that was really something. Um, you heard about Justin Trudeau being at this um, open air patio uh, that was accessible, uh, at least in an audio and visual way, from the sidewalk. And I, I got to ask you the first question. Given all the discourse regarding Prime Minister Trudeau, how in the world did he think it was a good idea to be, you know, seated somewhere where the public could access him? Because it wasn't just you. It seemed that everybody had an axe to grind that day. Uh, is he that delusional, Alexa? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, this is the most uh, incredible thing. His seat was the, the one next to the street, okay? And on the table, there were four. But he took the most visible seat uh, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in, in, in the table. So for my, my part, and as well, I was looking at the security that was with him, probably RCMP, but they were not doing anything. They were just standing on the side of the street and not even close from him. So if something was happened to it, like happened to him, they were really far away. They would not have been like possible to react uh, to protect like Justin Trudeau. So probably because a lot of people came really close to Justin Trudeau. I think it's the... Um, the uh, owner of the restaurant who called the police or I don't know, because <laughs> it seems that um, the police wasn't there when I arrived. They, they came afterwards, uh, maybe I would say five to 10 minutes after I came uh, to on the scene. And so you know, that that's very interesting, Alexa. And uh, but regardless, here's the thing. You were on a sidewalk. And geez, I'm getting visions of deja vu given what happened to me in yeah. Toronto in December. Um, of course, they can ban you or anyone from the restaurant. That's private property. Mm -hmm. But you cannot be pushed away from a sidewalk. That's public. Uh, we still have allegedly a free press in Canada. We're still allegedly a democracy. What in the world were the Montreal police saying to you to justify um, pushing you off the sidewalk, getting a little handsy with you, which I did not like to see. Um, mm -hmm. They were on thin ice legally, as far as I can tell, Alexa. Yeah, so first of all, they say that it was a municipality rule that you were not allowed to do nothing and just stand in the street. You needed to be always in movement. So it's why I started to, to walk around and they say, no, you can go there. You can go there. I was like, yeah, but you just asked me to, to be in movement. So it's what I'm doing. But, and they say, no, you cannot be here. You need to go to the other side of the street. This is a municipality rule. And I was like, no, you have no rule in the municipality that say that I cannot be in the public space as a sidewalk. And so they, they try to use intimidation as like being really close to me and say, move. And yeah. I was like, why are you doing that? You will not intimidate me. I, I'm here for doing my job. I'm a reporter and you have no right to ask me to move from a public area because you decided be, of your side that it was a new rule that you created for that special event. You know, I'd like to see that rule because I don't believe it. The idea that you've got to walk and talk like you're in a penitentiary um, yard and it's exercise time and that's <clears throat> all you're allowed to do. I mean, I bet you in Utremont there are panhandlers that are just standing there doing commerce, if you will. So I can't see why there's a stipulation banning the practice of journalism. But in a way, Alex, I got to tell you, uh, you got off lightly, I think, because I hearken back to my experience in 2019 in Montreal. Justin Trudeau had, it was an election campaign then, and Justin Trudeau had a photo op arranged at a boxing gym where he was sparring with another boxer. And when he was getting back on his bus behind a police wall, uh, I was like on my tiptoes raising my cell phone to ask him questions. And a member of the Montreal Police Service pushed me so hard I actually fell completely backwards. My head bounced off the concrete sidewalk. Trudeau's sparring partner, to his credit, came running out of the gym. He witnessed it, and he was very concerned. He said, are you okay? But what I'm getting at 
is this outrageous use of force. They know who I am. I have the rebel mic flash. I don't have a weapon. They know the prime minister is under no physical attack whatsoever, unless I guess we live in a, a country where impolite questions are considered physical assaults. What do you make of how the Montreal police are so heavy handed when it comes to cracking down on journalism, Alexa? Uh, but I think it's not like cracking on journalism. I think it's cracking on Ruben News because yeah. uh, they don't attack CBC. They don't attack like other like mainstream media from home. It's just us. Every time it's all about we don't want uh, Ruben News to be ar around. And uh, we need to mention that it was not mm, regular um, police that day. It was the riot police so they use they are the one that was probably sent in ottawa during the freedom convoy they are the one who are respecting the order that they receive uh, out there and so um they probably uh know that ribbon news is not legitimate but that is not true we are independent journalists we are not receiving like funding from the government yeah. and this is the most re respectful way to do our job no you're quite right and i remember more than a year ago uh it was a montreal police officer who accused us of being with what was it uh Jew media or Jew news, something like that. I mean, what the hell was that? But, you know, getting back on track, I, I thought the questions you asked were excellent, uh, Alexa. Uh, Tamara Leach, our political prisoner, uh, still mm -hmm. behind bars, shockingly. Um, what's going on with the Netherlands? Is this to come to Canada in terms of the war on nitrogen, uh, the uh, World Economic Forum agreements, and so on and so forth? And... I thought the prime minister could have done himself a service by respectfully answering your questions. Instead, as much as he likes to talk about sunny ways and his government being the most transparent in Canadian history, he just ignored you like you were some mosquito at that mm -hmm. patio. Um, if you were in his shoes, uh, um, Alexa, how would you have handled things? But first of all, I would probably ask you like to have maybe one person or two security and just go in the street and say, I'm going to talk with you and I we will try to discuss or we will try to talk. Most of the people who were there that day was, I would say, 85% children. That was not a threat in the street. Most of them <laughs> was, was just normal people who wanted some answer. Like that woman who see her... Uh, basket at the grocery increasing and seeing her mother not be able to buy the stuff that she used to do because the inflation is there. When we saw that Mr. Trudeau is eating a really nice meal with wine and just like mocking of all the Canadians who now cannot afford to buy uh, all the food that they want or the gas that they need. And so I, it's what I find that the most outrageous It's like, it doesn't care. He's eating his meal when he is like putting like, I don't know how many million, I think 8.5 Five million in the company for cricket farm, probably like for what uh, now introducing cricket as a protein for a uh, their citizen during the time that he is eating like nice meal and not private himself from like what climate change. I'm sorry, but uh, it's the perfect example of a law for me or a rule for me and a rule for D. No, uh, you're quite right about that, Alexa. And it, it's just uh, more of the same going back to last year when you were at the leadership uh, debate, which we needed another uh, federal court order to get into. And he completely snubbed you and our audience and Canadians in general by saying, uh, well, by copying one of his uh, boyfriend's tactics, Jugmeet Singh, which is, I don't take questions from Rebel News. Absolute cowardice. But we'll end it with this. I think at the end of the day, uh, Alexa, even if this wasn't your intention, you hum you humiliated uh, this man. Um, he's used to being lavished with praise and going to very controlled photo ops. And yet here was you, a reporter not on the uh, federal government dime. Here were some citizens who had an axe to grind with him. 
you ask these impolite questions over and over as he was trying to eat. I'm sure he was uh, steaming. Uh, I did the same last September at a uh, election stopover in Richmond Hill when he went to uh, campaign at a food truck event. Um, uh, I also asked uh, prickly questions. Of course, I think I paid a price for that in December when his Royal Canadian henchman uh, beat me up for staying on a, a sidewalk to scrum him. Uh, at the end of the day, um, I think that's a victory for you. Um, when it comes to seeing Justin Trudeau in the future, are you going to change your ways, Alexa, or are you going to continue uh, to get at him with these questions that the likes of uh, Rosemary Barton and company at the CBC would never dare ask? I will continue to make him answering the question that the population wants to hear. And I will tell you, he will know my name soon. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, Alexa, like I said, um, you didn't get answers to your question, uh, that, your questions rather. That was the bad news. The good news is you weren't beaten up. So uh, oh, wear, yeah. <laughs> wear, that, <laughs> wear that as a badge of honor. Thank you so much, my friend, and you have a great weekend. Thank you, you too. Thank you. And that was Alexa Lavoie in Montreal. Keep it here, folks. More of Rebel Roundup to come right after this. My mug? I know. It's pretty cool. So is this hoodie I got on. And you could have it on, too, if you check out our special website at rebelnewsstore.com. That's where you can see Freedom Focus hoodies that we have for you, beanies, cell phone cases, you name it, all while supporting our journalism, where we fight to bring you the other side of the story, as opposed to, you know, being forced by the Trudeau government to fund leftist media out of your taxes. The truth is... Without you and your generosity, there is no Rebel News. So again, if you like the reports that we bring you and that we also fight for freedoms in Canada, please consider doing some shopping, picking up some swag at rebelnewsstore.com. We appreciate your support. Hey folks, check out the newest arrival to the Rebel News Store. Yes, F is for Fidel and F is for father? I mean, could it be? Yes, it, half this photo, the colored half, is Justin Trudeau. The black and white half is a young Fidel Castro. Wait now, or is it vice versa? It's so confusing. Well, I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. Wouldn't it be great if we could have piece of Justin's DNA and a piece of Fidel's DNA and put the rumor to bed once and for all. But in the meantime, we'll just have to walk around wearing this shirt, hinting at a great Canadian conspiracy. Or is it? In any event, if you want to get this shirt, folks, go to the Rebel News Store and check this out. Type in our new discount code that summer. S-U-M-M-E-R, and if you buy two unisex t-shirts, you get an additional one for free. What a deal. Like I said, Justin Trudeau, Fidel Castro, as they used to say on the ABC detergent ads, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference. Wow, last time I checked, folks, that advertisement had some 20,000 views. And these shirts are indeed top sellers. So if you want one, please don't delay putting in your order. As for the comments, well, you know, one of the reasons I love our audience is that many of you are so savagely funny with your comments, especially when it comes to weighing in on the right honorable Justin Trudeau. Watching trains go by writes, if you are going to buy one, get it quick before the lawsuit and injunction, LOL. Hey, my friend, your advice is not all that far-fetched. The Trudeau liberals are all about censoring the internet with various bills they want to enact as laws in the months ahead. I wouldn't put it past, Justin, to have a new law regarding a dress code, a code for Canadians, namely, thou shalt not mock a liberal prime minister. After all, on Dominion Day weekend, F. Trudeau flags were actually banned from Parliament Hill. Like Fidel, our Justin is a huge fan of censorship. A redneck's life writes, 
I like that one, David. I have some liberals in my area, and they absolutely love Justin Trudeau. And wearing this shirt by them would be good. Hey, Mr. Redneck, please write back and let me know what neighborhood you live in. I'd love to meet people who are still Justin Trudeau supporters. And I just want to ask them one question. What has been Justin's greatest accomplishment in these past seven years? Typically, they are shocked into silence by that query. Albert Corbeil writes, good job on reporting on Brown. The conservatives are right to oust him. I love the t-shirt. Well, you know what, Albert? Maybe we need a Patrick Brown t-shirt as well. Hmm, what image could we put on that? Uh, maybe Pinocchio's elongated nose? Uh, perhaps a pair of smoldering slacks? Maybe a voice bubble emerging from Sneaky Patrick saying, trust me. Oh, what an embarrassment of riches when it comes to mocking that lying liar. Sharon McDonald writes, I know I would never put a picture of that creature on my body. You know, I feel your pain, Sharon, but consider this. Think of the pain Justin would endure seeing this shirt on your body. I mean, talk about a trigger. And Scotty writes, someone get on the phone to Cuba and get one of Justin's drink box water bottle sort of things when he discards it. There's a crowdfunding campaign if ever there was one. I'm getting some of those shirts. I'm already a huge collector. Nice work, guys. Well, thank you so much, Scotty. But just a word of caution I wouldn't wear this particular shirt if you are indeed Cuba bound. The authorities down there might not like any sort of haberdashery that raises questions about the not so dearly departed Fidel Castro. Say, do you think that Cuba, like China, is one of those basic dictatorships that Justin Trudeau has admiration for? Yes, <laughs> that was a rhetorical question, folks. Well, that wraps up another edition of Rebel Roundup. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week. And hey, folks, never forget, without risk, there can be no glory. Good night. <laughs>